Praise God, let's turn in the Word of God to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Let's pray as you turn there. Our Father, we thank and praise you for your word. We ask you now that we would truly hear your voice in the preaching of your word. Show us Jesus Christ, we pray. And in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 4. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. And, but the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship before me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Praise God for his word. Now there's an advert on the London Underground that I've seen a few times that says something like this. A razor with quite a good blade is like a secret agent with quite a good accent. A secret agent needs to have a perfect accent, otherwise he or she is no good in the country where they are. Similarly, a razor that's only quite good, well, brothers who shave, and even sisters who shave also, you may know that a not very good blade causes all kinds of problems. Something that is almost good enough is actually no good at all. An almost perfect saviour cannot save. Someone who is almost sinless, almost able to defeat the devil, almost able to fulfill God's promises, is no saviour at all. Without a perfect saviour, we have no gospel, we have no salvation, and we have no hope. Without a perfect saviour, we are lost. This very famous passage, and indeed this passage about the temptation of Jesus, is mentioned in full in, Mark, in Matthew and Luke, and in summary form in the Gospel of Mark. The fact it's mentioned in three Gospels shows it's very, very important. A few months ago, our brother Rob Pickering from Selhurst preached John Matthew's account 
in Matthew chapter 4. And there is much in these verses to teach us about resisting temptation ourselves, learning from the way Jesus resisted temptation. And that is a good and valuable application. But the main point of this passage is to show us the Lord Jesus Christ, to prove to us that he is not an almost good enough saviour, but he is the absolute perfect saviour who never sinned. He, this passage is to prove to us that all the devil's temptations fell to nothing, so that when Jesus went to the cross, he was truly the Lamb of God without spot or blemish. There was no sin. He didn't need to die for his own sins and therefore be unqualified to die for our sins. He went to the cross spotless and sinless to die in our place. This passage demonstrates to us that Jesus is more powerful than the devil. For us as Christians, we, for, temptation is, defeats us regularly through our own flesh and through the world's pressure and the temptations of the devil. But Jesus Christ resisted to the max and came out victorious. Everything you have as a Christian is because Jesus is a perfect saviour. Your forgiveness of sins, your peace with God, your hope for eternity, your adoption as a child of God, your fellowship with him, that boldness to come into the, to the throne of grace, fearless, coming into the presence of Almighty God. The fact that you are made clean and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, the fact the Bible speaks of the Christian being clothed in righteousness, so we stand before the holy God, accepted and complete in him. The fact that we can be assured, if you've trusted Jesus, you can be assured of heaven. There's not going to be, as it were, a, a test to go through in order to get to heaven. Because Jesus Christ, a spotless, victorious saviour, has won the victory and made the way for us. And every battle we face on earth, we can run to a strong saviour who we know from this passage has defeated the enemy. Jesus' temptations show us that Jesus is victorious. This passage makes it very clear to us that these temptations were no accident. It wasn't a sudden ambush by the enemy, but it was actually planned and purposed by the living God. Notice verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. And that takes us back towards the, the, the baptism of Jesus, just a few verses back into chapter 3, when it says in chapter 3, 22, after Jesus was baptized, it says the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. So he is full of the Holy Spirit. He is now declared to be. He already is the Messiah, but this makes it absolutely clear. He is the Messiah, anointed by the Holy Spirit. We see that, don't we, in, in, in Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Here he is, the anointed Messiah, the one promised in Isaiah 11 on whom would be the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of wisdom and might and so on. He is the promised one. He is the one also who is at this point pub publicly declared, this is my beloved son. Now he's already prophesied but to, by the angel to Mary, you shall bear a son and he shall be called the son of God. 
but here is this public declaration that then is part of the enemy's weaponry that is tried to be turned against him. Since you are the Son of God, do this. But then straight after that, we have this long list of names in Luke chapter 3 that we looked at at the, the beginning of before the summer break. And it ends with this in Luke 3.38, the second half of that verse, the son of Adam, the son of God. Reminding us that Jesus Christ is our representative, the son of Adam. What did Adam do? Adam sinned. Adam broke fellowship with God by his sin. From Adam, every single human being ever since has inherited a rebellious nature against God and is separated from God until repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Before Jesus came, it was repentance and faith, trusting in the one that was going to come. For us, after he's come, we look back to the one who has come and we look up to the one who's now reigning in heaven in glory. And so this was an appointed confrontation because Adam had failed in a garden surrounded by God's provision and blessing. Now the second Adam, the true son of God, the one who was promised back in the garden that would crush the serpent's head. He is the one who is now going into the wilderness. Notice the second half of Luke 4 verse 1. He was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. This was a God-appointed confrontation to prove that Jesus would be, was the promised one. He is the true man, the promised seed. And at this point, we would see the beginning of the fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. The tempter is defeated in the wilderness. And then that battle continues, and then we see on the cross that confrontation as Jesus dis takes our sin and destroys condemnation and accusation. And then we see in the resurrection, we see Jesus defeating the power of death, coming out of the grave. Remember Hebrews 2 says the devil holds people in by the fear of death. Jesus defeated death. And then on that final day, that final day when Christ returns, the victory will be completed and the devil will be thrown into the lake of fire. So this is like the first decisive, victorious battle, proving that Jesus is the true Messiah, and the true Saviour. And for us, helping us to see just how awesome and great our Lord Jesus is, Notice there it says in verse 2 that he was there for 40 days. And then that, what does that make us think of? Well, 40, remember, back in the wilderness wanderings, there were 40 years because of the 40 days that the spies were in the promised land. And then they rejected the promised land. And so God said, there will be 40 years while you wander in the wilderness. And round those 40 years in the wilderness, Israel failed again and again and again. So Jesus then, representing God's, all of God's people, goes into the wilderness for 40 days to confront the devil. It says there, for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. That's that sense of it, continuous temptation. He was tempted throughout the 40 days, and then there were these three climactic temptations that we're told about in this passage. It's important for us to understand here that Jesus was truly human, 
and so truly tempted. We know also he was truly divine. But we also know from the study of the scriptures and the, the, the historic, the, the history of the church that's examined who Jesus is and written us helpful declarations of who Jesus is, that Jesus is um, one person, one Lord Jesus Christ in two natures, God and man. One Lord Jesus Christ. And those two natures are not mixed or confused in any way. One person, two natures. And so when Jesus was in the wilderness being confronted by the devil, he wasn't getting a little bit of help from his divine nature, kind of making it a bit easier for him. He was facing the devil in the power of the Holy Spirit, confronting and defeating him. God the man facing down the enemy of our souls for us. The only difference between him and us in the sense of facing temptation is that Jesus had no sin nature. When we're tempted, temptation stirs up something inside because of our sinful nature. When Jesus was tempted, it was all an external attack upon him. Yet nonetheless, he faced it to the full. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I'm sure you have. But when temptation comes and you resist it, the power of that temptation seems to grow. And the longer you resist it for, the more powerful the temptation becomes. And then, because temptation takes a root from inside of us, we fall. And then we say, I'm not going to do it again. And for a while, the temptation's kind of just in the background, then it grows, then it grows, then it grows, then it grows. Jesus never gave in. So Jesus experienced the full power of temptation. That temptation rose and rose and rose throughout those 40 days, and he still said no. So he truly faced temptation worse than we would ever face. It was more powerful. It was a full frontal assault from the enemy of souls to try and pull down the second Adam and defeat God's plan, and Jesus resisted. Now that is wonderful news, because that means not only is he a sinless saviour, not only is that he, can we go through him to the throne of grace because he has made the way for us. But that means that when temptation is strong, we can run to a saviour who has resisted temptation to the max and overcome. And you know, we read, don't we, that we have one who is able to sympathise with our weaknesses. That's Hebrews chapter 4 and 15 and, and 16. He's able to sympathize with our weaknesses because he's tempted in every way like we are yet without sin. Notice it doesn't say that he empathizes. Now we empathize with each other about our sin because we sin too. We say, yeah, I know what that's like. I fall in that way as well. And while that is comforting to know that we're not on our own, it doesn't actually change us. But to have a saviour who sympathises, who pours into our lives his compassion and his strength because he has faced temptation to the maximum and he's overcome, that's great news. Because that means not only is there forgiveness when we fall, there is strength to keep fighting from him who's won the victory for us. So we have a mighty and amazing Saviour. And because of his success, because of his victory, because of his total perfect righteousness that he now closes with, 
we can approach the throne of grace and be welcomed and accepted. Praise God. Jesus came to face the devil. This was the beginning of this battle. In the wilderness, the cross, in the garden, on the cross, the to- empty tomb. And then we're told in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 about, as it were, that, 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 that the final human enemy or organization that the man of sin that the Son of God will destroy with the breath of his mouth. And we read with Revelation that the enemy be thrown into the lake of fire, finally and utterly destroyed. But right now, because of Jesus Christ, the enemy is defeated. He's fighting, but he's defeated. He cannot win. Jesus Christ has won. Now, that doesn't mean the battle's not difficult. The temptations themselves sought, or at least the second, particularly the second temptation, I'll give you the nation of the world if you bow down and worship me, was an attempt by the devil to, to get Jesus to take what is his without the cross. And the devil wants to come to us and say, you need an easy life. Don't be such a strong Christian. Don't be quite so bold. Because if you're a little bit more quiet, just go to church on Sunday and, and then don't tell anybody. Don't live a righteous life. Don't repent of your sin. Just try, just be an external Christian. That's Christianity without the cross. That's what the devil wants us to experience so that, or to, to follow so that we don't follow the way of Christ. So yes, the devil is still powerful in that sense of tempting and accusing and stirring up opposition to the gospel and stirring up persecution and so on, but he's already lost. Jesus has won. I think we only have time this morning to look at the first temptation. We'll see how we get on with that, uh, with our time today. I have prepared three temptations, but I'm conscious we've got a shorter service this morning. Let's look at this first temptation and what it shows us about Jesus Christ. Verse 3, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Now remember I said that the devil links his temptations to the declaration of what Jesus, the Father made over Jesus Christ when he was baptized. This is my beloved Son. The devil's saying, well, you're the Son of God. That means you, 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 can, you can do what you want. This is an appeal by the devil to become independent of the Father. Although it's impossible, there's a sense in which the, the, the devil wanted to break up the Trinity. Well, if, if, if the Son can go his own way, then I've won. And of course, he couldn't break up the Trinity. By the Son, Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end, eternal, forever, ever has been and ever will be. He could not do it, but this was his attempt, an attempt to cast doubt upon the Father's care. If you're the Son of God, don't you think after 40 days that your Father will give you something to eat? Don't you think he's withholding something from you? He's not showing you the love and the care that you should have as his son. You're lacking something. And because you're the son of God, you've got the power to go and get it for yourself. So why don't you go and do that? We have here hints of the Garden of Eden temptation. Remember that the the serpent said to Eve, has God not said you cannot eat of any tree? Suggesting that somehow God is holding something good 
back. And then when he begins to point to the tree of the knowledge of good, of good and evil, he says, God knows that when you eat of it, you will know good and evil. That God is being bad and he's failing you in holding something good back from you. That is the essence of the temptation. And so, as he said to Eve, encourage Eve to take and eat. So he encouraged Jesus to use his divine power to transform a stone into bread and take and eat independently of his Father's provision. Then Jesus says, Scripture. I know we're not talking so much about what this teaches us about resisting temptation ourselves, but you can't miss this. Jesus stood against temptation through the Word of God. And that is exactly how we do too, which we will come on to in a future time we look at this passage together. But it's interesting what he specifically quotes. So if, we, if you've got a, a, a physical Bible, it'd be good to turn there. So Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And verses, let's, say, let's look at verses 2 and 3. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. It says this, You shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness. You see, even there, there's that link. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. You told me two, sorry, you told me eight, verse two, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And again, that is a t links us back to Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted, and that word means tested and examined. So the devil is trying to show that Jesus isn't really the one. But this temptation is an examination that says, Jesus, you really are the one. And so the manna in the wilderness was a test to see whether Israel would truly trust God for the daily provision. Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's, that section of that verse is what Jesus quotes here. Man does not live by bread alone. Well, the, the extended quotation in Matthew continues, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And this itself takes us back to Exodus 16, which was when the manna began to be provided because Israel was grumbling that there was no food. And the test for Israel was, will Israel trust God each day for his provision through his mighty word? The test for Jesus was, would he trust God to provide for him in the wilderness just like he provided for Israel in the wilderness? Will he trust God's provision? Will he listen to the lies of the devil that say, oh God, God can't really love you. You're the son of God and you need to act and get yourself some food pretty quick. And Jesus says, no, man does not live by bread alone. And the context is every word that comes from the mouth of God. But actually, I'm trusting my father provide. I'm trusting my Father to provide. And you know because he trusted his Father to 
to provide. The temptation fell to the ground. And something else is in this which shows us our Lord Jesus Christ in his beauty and glory is that the words of his Father were more important to him than his physical nourishment. And I wonder if we have that same attitude. Are the words of our Father in heaven of more value to us than our physical nourishment? Because this is how Jesus resists. I'm trusting the word of my Father's provision like he did the manna in the wilderness. And I'm loving my Father's word more than anything else. I and mean, that is how he stands. And that is our spotless saviour now, that we go to the Father in his name. He's the one who is encouraged to stop trusting the Father and provide his own way. And when we fall, because we think, oh, God's not working, let me work it out myself. How often do we do that, whether it's big decisions about where, where, we, where we live, where, where we worship, who, who we marry, about jobs. We think, oh, I've got to work it out myself. God's not working. But Jesus trusted the daily provision. And it can mean the little things. Well, my, I, I, I want a bit more. So I'm going to work longer hours, work harder. And there's nothing wrong with that, but when it then affects our family and our service for God, then we actually are beginning to follow the way the devil wants us to go to separate us from our fellowship and walk with our Father and our fruitfulness in the kingdom of God. Because we're going our own way and trying to provide for ourselves. But Jesus resisted. And you know those times when we do stop trusting and then we go our own way, when we return back to the Father, we find forgiveness because Jesus trusted to the end. And you know in these representative temptations, we find a saviour who triumphed on our behalf. Whatever sin we may fall into, we have a sufficient saviour as he triumphed on our behalf. Jesus trusted the Father. He's depended on the Word. And so he remains a strong saviour who will cover us when we don't listen to the Father and take things into our own hands. That's good news. Can I encourage you to follow in Jesus' footsteps and listen to the Father and not take things into your own hands? But can I also remind you that when you do, and even if you're right now, you're in a situation thinking, I'm actually here right now because in the past, I've done it my way. You know, God can transform your current situation right now and use it for his glory even though the, the, the way you've got there has been through a path of independence. Bring it to him now. Confess your sin to him now. And look up at your mighty and all-sufficient Saviour who has rescued you and has defeated the devil. There's two more temptations, but I have the advantage of looking at the clock and seeing that actually there's probably enough for us to feed on and be nourished with today. Look at your Saviour, who went into the wilderness on your behalf to confront the devil and won. The devil was worse than Goliath. We see a picture of Jesus in David. David, our representative, going to defeat Goliath. But here, it's not Goliath, it's the devil. And Jesus wins. And if you think about the way the devil works, he works through temptation. Jesus defeated temptation here in the garden. He works through accusation and condemnation. 
Jesus removed every accusation against his people on the cross. There's no condemnation. He worked with the fear of death. Jesus defeated death through the resurrection. And he works through the fear that somehow God will let us go. And yet you go to these temptations and you find a spotless saviour. Someone illustrated it like this. When you're not a Christian, it's like, um, you know those, those um, people used to hold, put their keys on their belt and have the, you see sometimes workmen with keys dangling from their belt. When you're not a Christian, you are connected to Adam's belt. You're dangling around, going in your own life, living your own way. When you're saved, you're transferred to Jesus' belt. And you know what? You'll never fall off his belt. And the fact that he defeated the devil means he's strong enough to keep you all the way to glory. And the fact that he's a spotless saviour means that his prayers in heaven are perfect. And therefore his prayers for you to keep going and, and be in glory are perfect. And they, will be, they are accepted by the Father. So you are secure. So let's respond with faith. Let's respond by saying, Jesus, I trust you. Let's respond by saying, Jesus, I love you. I want to worship you. Let's respond by saying, Jesus, I want to be like you that loves your Father's word more than anything else. Will take nourishment from my soul as more important than nourishment from my body. And I will not go my own way, but trust your faithful provision for me as a child of God. And absolutely finally, if you're not yet a child of God, because you've not yet trusted Jesus, it's time to repent of your sin and trust him who will take you off Adam's belt, off the road of condemnation and separation from God's love and will bring you into his kingdom, and forgive you your sins and set you on the road. Yes, a road of trouble, ups and downs, but still the road to glory. Trust him today. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for these precious verses of Scripture. And we pray, Lord God, that you would write them afresh upon our heart today and help us to see Jesus clearly for your glory in his name. Amen.